talk. So let me very briefly talk about Argentina. Um, Argentina is one of the most recent cases of implementing a program that mimics the job guarantee. It is not job guarantee, I want to emphasize, it's actually a limited program. Uh, but it was a large-scale program, it was implemented quite quickly, and in our view, effectively. So we have been studying this program and looking at the macro effects, as well as going to projects and visited those projects to see what they did and how they impacted people. Now, um, even though it was a smaller program, it still exhibited the features that I was um, just discussing of this sort of macro-universal job guarantee program. The Argentinian program was implemented as an emergency measure. It was depression economics. You know, people took to the streets, they demanded from the government jobs, the government gave them jobs. And uh, they gave them jobs, the program was running, um, up and running in a few months. Just like the New Deal um, era experience, we were able to organize things to do for the unemployed relatively quickly. Um, it was a part-time job, it offered four hours of community work to the unemployed heads of households at a minimum hourly wage. And two million people showed up for work. This is about 13% of the labor force um, in Argentina. And Argentina, granted, is coming down from 25% of you know, unemployment. So they, you know, their levels were um, close to our real actual unemployment levels, but l higher than our official levels. They, uh, this program had a considerable impact on the poor and uh, especially on women and minorities who had access to this job. It was counter-cyclical. It stabilized output, prices, and currency. You look at the data and you will find all of those indicators stabilized. GDP growth was um, uh, between 8 and 12 percent from 2003 to um, 2007 and only in the last year it dipped to 5 percent. So it's job creation that produces growth um, as opposed to the other way around. The government budget moved into surplus. Okay? There are a variety of things going on there, but uh, of course you're generating uh, large, you know, a large amount of incomes which are being taxed. The multiplier effect of this program, I've looked at some of the measures, some of the more conservative measures, are, is uh, 2.57, meaning that for every dollar spent on the program, you're creating 2.6 dollars um, uh, uh, of output. Now, um, and what happened? Did people get stuck in the public sector? No. Actually, what happened was that as the economy recovered, many uh, workers transitioned uh, into private sector jobs. It, it, has, it was organized in a very interesting way. I can tell you about all those institutional details, um, how it was administered, how, it was, um, how the resources were mobilized. But suffice to say, it was federally funded, locally administered. Um, the government actually maintained a database of skill and experience of, of the unemployed, uh, helped them transition to private sector jobs as well. And uh, uh, from our visits as well, um, it was obvious um, what kind of impact this program had on the poor. It empowered, um, it provided on-the-job training. Every project that we went to see had an adjacent room with literacy education, with training, with um, various other courses that they can take. Um, I like to see this as like a new form of microfinance, as opposed to lending to people. You just give them a grant for the wages and for the materials, get them on their feet, get them to produce something. And pretty much every project that we saw was some uh, people that set up shops, carpentry shops, or baby clothes tailoring shops, or toy shops, uh, something that they could then sell on the market but they were also products that were uh, freely distributed to the poor. Um, lots of food kitchens, uh, daycare center, uh, public uh, libraries, um, elder care uh, uh, centers for the abused, um, etc. Again, the employers ha uh, hired from the pool um, uh, in the economy, uh, the economy stabilized very quickly. One benefit of this was that it formalized the informal sector. In Argentina, actually, there's a very large share of the economy that's a gray economy. Those that used to work under the table, where you should social security tax uh, cards, they would be, um, when they transitioned to private sector jobs, now they were working under contract. Um, the program established a wage floor. From all the people that transition, uh, you know, uh, a sort of a wage floor because it's a limited program, but from all the people that transitioned from the public sector uh, job to the private sector, they were all hired at a premium. 
you know, 97 percent of those were hired at a premium. Um, and communities were transformed. I can give you lots of examples. But what was interesting is that the unemployed themselves proposed a lot of these projects. They were the ones that actually invented the kinds of things that they did. They did massive landfill cleanups and recycling initiatives and on and on and on. So these are some, some pictures of, of, um, of projects that we visited and uh, you know, lots of food kitchens, uh, there were you know, lots of poor, poor communities, but there were things like health promotion uh, programs, subsistence farming. Um, uh, there were a lot of projects outside of the greater Buenos Aires area, which we visited, that dealt with the agricultural projects, you know, water irrigation, clay pits, etc. So again, uh, growth itself is not the appropriate target. It, it's a, you, know, you, have to, you have to wed it to um, uh, job creation. It can promote inequality, this sort of pro-growth or growth at all costs uh, approach can promote uh, inequality. It can harm the environment. We haven't really said anything about the environment yet. So we are, you know, we are really looking at a bottom-up approach um, that looks at full employment through direct job creation, a job guarantee, we view this as a program for shared prosperity. Uh, you could set an environmentally sustainable growth path um, and maintain uh, price and currency stability. We can do it. We have done it uh, uh, once in the past, as have other countries in one form or another. Um, it's the right thing to do. I think we could debate this, but um, you know, I want to get back to the point about having access to a job as a basic human right. Um, and I, in my opinion, I think Obama just needs a, a Rooseveltian resolve. Uh, uh, so we have a deficit in convictions, I think, a deficit in cleverness, not necessarily an ability to fund. And let me end with a couple of quotes. One is by FDR. It says that, you know, the liberty of a democracy is not safe if its business system does not provide employment and produce and distribute goods in such a way as to sustain an acceptable standard of living. And the last quote is the, a quote from Keynes, and this is something that we as academics constantly uh, run against, um, and that's this idea that we have to keep 5% or 10% of the population in idleness. The conservative belief that there is some law of nature which prevents men from being employed, that it is rash to employ men or women, and that it is financially sound to maintain a tenth of the population in idleness is crazily improbable. The sort of thing which no man could believe who had not had his head fuddled with nonsense for years and years.